Welcome back to my smart learning. This is a lesson for year 12s. We're looking at genetic diversity from yesterday and now we're continuing on with types of selection. So this is A-level biology, so if you're doing GCSEs it's probably not relevant to you. However, if you're thinking of doing uh, A-level biology and you're a GCSE biology student, this will be relevant to you, um, hence why I put it on, show my homework for 11Q, U and E. So what we're we looking at today, types of selection. What is selection and how does it affect diversity? That's our learning objective today, but before we start, I always like to have a quick reminder of some things we learned from yesterday or the last lesson. So recall quiz, quick high five if you get them all right. So, number one, what this is the definition, you tell me what the keyword is. Write these uh, five answers down and uh, pause the video and then uh, we'll check them at the end. So, number one, uh, what is the word we use for a sequence of DNA that's coding for a polypeptide? Number two, different versions of a gene. So, what's the word we use for different versions of a gene? Number three, what is the definition of species, of a species? Number four, what do we call all of the genes in a population? All of the genes in a population. And number five, uh, this one isn't a one word answer. So this one's possibly a four marker or six marker question. Can you write down in bullet point the Darwin's theory of evolution? Okay, so what's his explanation behind uh, evolution. So write the answers down, pause the video and we'll go through it in a second. Right, so if you've had a go at that, uh, number one, sequence of DNA coding for a polypeptide is a gene. Number two, different versions of a gene, we call them an allele, allele or alleles, which is a double -L, l e l e s. Definition of a species is a group of organisms with similar features. However, the main uh, important part of this is that they are able to breed to produce living, fertile offspring. So a group of organisms that can, that can breed to produce living and fertile offspring. Uh, all of the genes in a population was last lesson's uh, title, it was genetic diversity. And we can also call that the gene pool. So genetic diversity or the gene pool. And the last one, Darwin's theory of evolution, which is the main uh, section of last lesson. Where do we start off with this one? Well, in all populations, there is differences. There's variety. There's variety within a population. So that's, where we, that's the starting point. Now, for some reason, there may be some random mutations within that population. That makes it so that there is differences in, amongst that population. And remember, the key thing here is that you don't change because of the environment. Okay, you either already have that particular adaptation which is suitable for that environment, or you don't. And that's because you were born with them. So the genes that you have already will give you those particular features. However, a mutation may give you a different feature compared to your neighbour. And you may have a disadvantage because of that gene change, that mutation, which means you may eventually get wiped out because it's a disadvantage, or it might be a completely nothing mutation, so nothing happens, so you're the same as you were before, or it becomes an advantage. And it's that thing where if it becomes an advantage, is where you can outcompete your neighbour. So you have competition amongst the population. So the first thing is variation. The variation may have been due to uh, a gene mutation, a random gene mutation. The third mark here is that there is competition amongst the species in that population. Then we coined that phrase, natural selection or survival of the fittest. So the ones that are best adapted to the environment because they've already got that change, not because they are adapting, because they've already got that change. The ones that are best adapted survive. They get more resources, food, shelter, all that kind of stuff, water. They outcompete the neighbour, therefore they can successfully reproduce. And as they successfully reproduce, they pass on that advantageous allele 
to the next generation and that continually happens generation after generation after generation and that's known as natural selection so that's what we looked at last time now what we're looking at here is types of selection so we talked about natural selection but what can that do to the features inside the population what can it do to the um, characteristics of the um, of the the individuals in that population so that's what we're focusing on so what do I need to know what is selection what environmental factors exert selection pressure and what is the difference between stabilizing and directional selection and there's also one more we're going to look at is disruptive uh, selection which isn't uh, in your textbook, in the computer textbook. However, you do need to know about it because um, it's. We'll look at some examples in a second. So, we need to understand these principles. So let's start off with the first one. So, blood groups. There's four possible blood groups. You either blood group O, blood group A, blood group B, or you've got both of them, blood group A B. But if you look, it's not evenly spread out amongst the population. There's far more. Blood groups 40, uh, blood group O, okay, so nearly half the population of blood group O, and then nearly, not quite half, but 40% are blood group A. So the, the minority are blood group B, and the very, very small minority of blood group AB. So there's a, a distribution that's not evenly spread out. Now, your um, features and your characteristics are not all what we call monogenetic. So monogenetic would mean that it's just one gene that controls that particular factor, that characteristic. So for instance, cystic fibrosis, which is a debilitating inherited disease, is a, a recessive gene. It's just one gene that causes that problem. However, most of our features, okay, are what we call polygenetic. So polygenetic, uh, polygenetic, polygenic inheritance. What do we mean by that? It's a number of uh, alleles that interact with each other that allow that um, uh, characteristic so we've looked at you've looked at uh, monohybrid crosses already okay so but what we're focusing on that's to do with uh, a single gene but what we're focusing on is that many of our characteristics are controlled by many genes or even on different chromosomes that will uh, interact with each other so what does that lead to? Well, it leads to two types of variation. Now we've looked at this back at GCSE. You've got discontinuous variation and you've got continuous variation. Discontinuous variation is when you either have one thing or another thing. So those blood groups that we looked at before, A, B, A, B, and O, are discontinuous variation because there's only four different ones you can have, okay? And they're four distinct things. So here, for instance, you've got either purple flower or white flower. That's it. So that's discontinuous variation. And we represent that with bar charts. Whereas continuous variation is the, where there's the small gradual changes in, uh, for instance, color or height or length of your foot or things like that. Okay. So it continues. We use line graphs to represent those. So, for instance, here's one. This is a discontinuous variation. Uh, you've either got you can either tongue roll or you can't. So if you stick out your tongue as far out as you can, like that, and then you try to roll it. So in our population, you either are a tongue roller or you're not. So for instance, if I stick my tongue out and I try to roll it, you can see that I can roll my tongue. If you take your tongue out and you roll it, most of you should be able to tongue roll. There's the few people in the population, so usually we would do this in a lesson, we've been in a class, we'll go around and ask everybody, stick your tongue out, see if you can roll it. And there would be in a class of, let's say, 20 people, maybe one or two people that can't tongue roll because they don't have that particular gene to do that, okay? So that could be a, a monogenetic uh, inheritance because it's just a particular gene. And if it's just one particular gene, then you'll get discontinuous variation and you'll represent it with a bar chart because you've only got individual things that you can do so for instance tongue rolling would be just two bars you have the vast majority of really big bar showing you can tongue roll and a very small bar where not many people can't tongue roll and you can do that the same thing with your ears and things like that earlobes are they attached or are they unattached okay so 
However, what we're looking at with this type of, uh, on our selection is we're looking at continuous variation. Now, if you recognize these chaps, looks a little bit pixelated. Well, we've got Sean Connery on the left-hand side, who's six foot three. Uh, George Lazenby, we probably, nobody probably recognizes who he is, but he's six foot two, so he's an inch shorter. Uh, Roger Moore, six foot one. So these guys are all much taller than me. And then uh, Timothy Dalton, who's six foot, who's a, probably about my, he's about my height. Okay, Timothy Dalton. And I have no idea why Mel Gibson, who must be pretty short out down there, who's at five foot eight. Okay, so the average guy in the UK is probably about five, nine, ten, five, nine or five, ten, something like that. So six foot is probably just slightly above average. Um, but these guys are your previous James Bonds, if you didn't know. Um, James Bond right now is Daniel Craig. He's probably going to do his last one and he'll be off and there'll be somebody else. Um, but you can see there's a gradual change. So this is um, continuous variation. And we show continuous variation with a curve like this. Now this curve is known as a normal distribution. Because if I got all those individual people that are such a height, such a height, such a height. Now let's say the average height for a guy is five foot 10, let's say, that bar will be there. And everybody who's shorter, there'll be, let's say, a thousand people there, then there might be 999 people there, and then 970 people there, and then so on and so on and so on. So very, 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 uh, so for this side, this side will be the taller people, that side will be the shorter people, obviously, and back to front here. So that's the really, really, uh, the average there, let's say five foot 10, that might be five foot nine, five foot eight, five foot seven, six, so on and so on. So the vast majority of people, the average, are the average height, obviously, and then they get taller and taller, so that might be six foot, six foot two, six foot four, what have you. And you can see the taller and taller and taller you get, there's a lot, lot fewer people. So extremely tall people, there might be only one or two people. Extremely short people might be one or two people, very, very few. But the vast majority are in this bit of the curve here. And we call this a normal distribution. So we've got continuous variation, we use this bell-shaped curve. It'll be the same as your exam results. So when you get your um, A-level results or any GCC results, what have you, the vast majority of people will get the average grade, which will be C's and D's for your A-levels, okay? There'll be very few people with the E grade and very few people that fail, very, very few people. And then on this side, you'll get the people, few people getting, well, very few people getting A stars, and then a uh, few people getting A's here, and then B's will be about here, and then your C's and your D's are around here. So these are your sort of the average student. Okay, so, um, so we do this uh, normal distribution as, as a continuous variation. Now this is important when we're looking at the two uh, or the three different types of selection that we're focusing on today. So, normal distribution is a special type of frequency distribution that we just saw. It's a curve, it has a symmetrical bell shape, so we sometimes call it a bell-shaped curve. Uh, the correct term is normal distribution. All of the, the mode, the median, and the mean are all at the same point, right bang in the middle. So everything from that, 50% of it will be on the right of it, and 50% of it will be on uh, the left of that mean, or the mode, or the... Um, median okay so the standard deviations we'll focus on another time that's gonna be in a few lessons time but everything within that range is 95 percent of that majority bit in the middle of that bell shape the five percent so two and a half and two and a half on either end is right down at the bottom two tips so directional selection then so we're going to, we're focusing on three types of selection what is directional selection now I've left that point there because it's a really, really important point. This happens because of random mutations, not because you're adapting to the change in the environment. So for instance, if I felt really, really hot right now, I could put the fan on, open the windows, take a shirt off, that kind of stuff to cool down. That's a kind of instantaneous adaptation. You're making that change. If I felt really, really cold, I can put a woolly jumper on, put a coat on, put the heating on, so on and so on. Those are instantaneous adaptations. Organisms don't do that. There are seasonal adaptations and short-term adaptations, but that's not gonna make you survive 
a massive environmental change or, or you have gradual environmental changes but if your body hasn't adapted or hasn't hasn't got that adaptation because of those genes you're going comp you're competing with others in your population so for instance if it's speed that you're looking for so the fastest ones will be able to get to the food the quickest that kind of idea now it's your genes that will give you those particular characteristics if you don't have them you can't suddenly become faster obviously that's a bit of a loose analogy because you can train obviously and get a bit faster but generally speaking if you're thinking about let's say camouflage for instance you can't just suddenly decide to change your skin color unless you're michael jackson obviously yeah, a bit strange odd uh, analogy but you've got the idea you can't just suddenly say right i'm going to change today and that's it you organisms can't do that a dog that's walking around the street can't just suddenly decide i'm going to go and put a coat on okay um, obviously they've got seasonal changes where uh, mammals get a bit furrier in the winter when it's colder so they get fluffier like rabbits get fluffier and then in the summer they molt and they lose some of their fur so you've got those seasonal adaptations okay they, but this small small type of uh, um, adaptation sort of a little bit this side a little bit that side but we're talking about something that's causing um, just, you know uh, organisms to die out then those little small changes aren't going to be enough so what we've got here then is that random mutations cause a particular uh, number in the population, it could be the next generation, to have those small changes. That might be the advantage that we just talked about natural selection. So those ones will survive. The ones that don't have that particular feature will die out. So there'll be fewer of them and more of the other. And that can cause a shifting in the uh, allelic frequency that we talked about in the gene pool, the allele frequency of that particular organism. Now, here's the uh, example that you've got here of the bacteria. So, we've got normal distribution, that's why we need to understand this concept of normal distribution. This is the population size, the number of individuals in the population. This red line is the original line. That is the population of the non resistant bacteria here. So, these bacteria don't have. Um, uh, the resistance to a particular antibiotic because that antibiotic's not about this bacteria doesn't need to worry that's its particular um, distribution okay its ability to uh, resist a, a particular type of antibiotic okay so it's got low resistance over there this side's got high resistance suddenly this antibiotic suddenly is in the population now so it's around so maybe a, a in the hospital or a new uh, medical company's come up with a new a pharmaceutical company's come up with a new drug there's more of this drug around this penicillin or uh, this antibiotic so what happens then is these guys would quite easily die off but within that population there's some of them that have got a slightly higher um, resistance to that particular antibiotic so these guys here anything that's living in this bit here so this is this green line here anything that lives on this side here with this kind of uh, resistance will survive. These guys here, you give the antibiotic, they're more likely to die. So then there's not many of them about, but there's more of these guys about, which means as they divide, because they, they're not going through sexual reproduction, bacteria go through what we call binary fission, they split and split and split. There's gonna be more of those genes in that gene pool. So what tends to happen over time then, is there's more of them, so then this side comes to this side, and you can see there's a whole shift in this normal distribution. This bell shape has shifted to the right. This is known as directional selection. It's moved in a direction. It can move to the right or it can move all the way to the left, depending on what the environmental factor is. Here the environmental factor is this, um, this antibiotic that's in the environment. Okay, so what you've got now is there's more of this bacteria that's got a higher resistance to the antibiotic because it shifted along. Let me give you a different example of where this could, could potentially happen. So for instance, let's imagine um, this, is for, this, this red shape, this red bell, is for organisms that are, um, let's say mammals, that are not very hairy. So not much hair on their body. Okay, so quite um, more skin, less hair. So if you imagine the environment was quite nice and warm, okay, like a nice sunny day today, it's not going to bother them too much, okay, they're going to be happy days. 
However, imagine the environment gradually, slowly starts to get colder. So you're going into, so let's say, an ice age or something. Now, what's going to happen? Anybody that's, you know, got no hair and um, bald, they're going to get really cold. And they've got a disadvantage. They can shiver and shiver to death, right? They get too cold and they die. However, if there's ones in the environment that say, if you imagine this is all like hairless and this is a little bit of hair, the ones that have got a little bit of hair or got a bit more hair, they will survive because they can trap a layer of air and um, access insulation, keep them warmer for longer. They can go out for longer, go out hunting, get some more food. So what will happen then? So if you imagine the normal distribution will start to shift to the right. So then you've got a bit more hairier, okay, and then as you can, and you can continue to keep moving very slowly, gradually to the right, because they'll get to a point where you'll have the optimum amount of hair. Because obviously, too much hair might not be an advantage, but you've got the right amount where it's keeping you warm. Okay, so you'll get this movement of this population to the right because the length of the hair. So if this x axis said length of hair, the hair will be longer, and the distribution, normal distribution, has shifted to the right because that hairier body is an advantage compared to a body with no hair in cold conditions. So that's what directional selection is. We're going to look at what we call stabilizing selection. Stabilizing selection. So stabilizing selection again, same concept, there's random mutations in the population that allows that change to happen. And those random mutations are passed down through the gametes to the next generation. It's not because you are changing because of the environment. You must make sure you don't get that mistake because that is a common misconception. So this one then is to do with um, squashing the bell shape. Okay, so if you imagine this is our normal distribution, what you're doing is you're squeezing it from the left and the right and you're squashing it up. So this bit here, this mean, at this moment is quite low down. If I squeeze it and I squash it up, then this bit pushes upwards. OK, so why does that happen? Well, the example that you've got here is uh, birth weight, OK, the birth mass here. So why would that happen? Well, if a baby's really, really uh, got a very low birth weight, then the probability is that the, the baby can die because it hasn't got enough you know, fat on it or you know, enough mu muscle mass or what have you. So it can cause health problems. So when the baby's born, the baby can um, uh, you might end up with a stillbirth and so on and so on. So there, there might not be a, a successful birth there. So if it's very, very low, not ideal. So we don't want a very low birth weight. On the flip side, you don't want a very high birth weight because the mum has to give birth to that baby. If the baby's way too big, now obviously in the medical age, medical era now, this modern era, we've got cesarean section. So obviously if this was an issue now, people would go to the hospital and have a C-section. However, if you imagine this is in natural circumstances, it could be, you know, for, for dogs, for a puppy or what have you, uh, being born. You don't want them to be underweight because they die. You don't want them to be too big because if they're too big, they might, the, the mum may not be naturally able to give birth. The baby can die, the mum can die. Okay, so over thousands of years of evolution, what you find is there's an optimum birth weight. Okay, so you don't want to be too low, you don't want to be too high. So here it's got it in, in the masses of arbitrary units of a 10 and 20 there. And what's happened is it's squashed it so that the, the peak now is much higher on this mean here. So this is known as stabilizing selection because you're stabilizing the optimum. Okay, so the mean peaks up. And the next one then is called disruptive selection. Now disruptive selection uh, a good example would be what we looked at last time, which was the peppered moth. This one here is disruptive selection. This one here is just so that you can compare it. This one here was our stabilizing. So if you started off on the red, this red one has turned into the blue. So remember it was wide and it's been squashed so that this peak should actually, this one should be higher. It should peak up like this. So this one is your stabilizing selection. This one is your disruptive. So the red is before. So imagine it was on the left hand side, this normal distribution. And what's happened over time is this normal distribution has shifted 
to the right. So this one is your directional selection. This is your stabilizing selection from the previous two slides. This one is what we call a disruptive selection. So this is what happened to the, the, the peppered moth. So if you imagine you started off with one type of peppered moth, let's say like a, a brownish colored one, and then you're gonna end up with one that's kind of white and one that's kind of dark. Okay, so like, let's just give them easy colors. Like there's a white one there and there's a black one there. That one would have been the brown colored one. Now, the brown colored one probably lived happily at first before the industrial revolution because uh, there was, the trees were brown and what have you. And what would have happened with this disruptive selection, you squeeze this down in the middle, you squashed it down and you pushed it up there and you pushed it up there. So in the countryside where there's less pollution and the trees are, uh, there's, there's no pollution, the trees are not light brown or what have you, the white moths could survive in that particular area because it's more clean and there's less pollution around okay these guys can camouflage better there okay whereas with the uh in the city where there's loads and loads of pollution because of all the smog from the industrial revolution all the factories and stuff all the buildings would have been covered with soot and the smog in the air and so on and so on and then the black peppered moth would um, camouflage better over there so those guys will survive more so the bits in the middle there's no point Okay, because they, in the countryside, you're either like this, it's clean, and it's like light, it's like the white color. In the country, in the city, it's black, you're better camouflaging there. So there's less and less need for those sort of middle colored ones, because it's neither here or there. Okay, because they'll get eaten, they'll get seen in that situation, they'll get seen in that situation by the birds, they'll eat them. So there's a, a low gene frequency or allelic frequency of that color, but the lighter color is there in the countryside, and the um, darker ones are there in the city. So you could eventually, if they don't mix again and breed, you can end up with what we call geographical isolation where they're two separate places and they become, they could eventually over a long period of time, become two different complete species. Okay, so, um, so that's disruptive selection. And the last thing we'll look at is these adaptations then. So, Obviously, you know what adaptations are. It's the features that you have that allow you to survive, or that you are, you know, adapted to your particular niche. They give you the characteristics that make you suitable for that particular environment. But what kind of adaptations do we have? Well, we've got things like anatomical. So anatomical comes from anatomy. So what we're we talking about? You're talking about things like your height. Okay. So you could be tall or you could be short. Your anatomy could be uh, the amount of muscle mass and so on and so on. It could be hair length. The ones that I've kind of talked about already. So anatomical is the physical features of the, of the organism's body. Okay, so it could be the color of the the moths' uh, wings, the peppered moths, so on. Physiological is to do with the, uh, the the biochemistry of that particular organism. So a particular example that you guys got in your textbook, I think, is the kangaroo rat. It talks about um, the kangaroo rat is living in the desert, so there's not much water around. So you're going to have to find water, but if there's much water around, it's going to be very difficult to survive because you need water for life. However, if the kangaroo rat, what it can do, what other mammals can't do, is it can oxidize fats. So if you can oxidize the, uh, the lipids inside of its body and turn that into water, then there's some water there. Whereas uh, other organisms will only be oxidizing carbohydrates, okay, your sugars, to re uh, for aerobic respiration and release water that way. Okay, so um, so the kangaroo rat has a physiological adaptation depending on, on that situation, that hot, dry conditions. Behavioural adaptations are very simple, it's your behaviours, the kinds of things that organisms do as a behavioural response. So for instance, the one example in your book, it's got, it's got the swallows. Now, you know that birds migrate during the winter. So why do they migrate? Why do the birds fly south? They fly from Europe down to Africa. Well, in the winter, it's very cold. Uh, when it's cold, uh, the trees lose their leaves, there's, um, and the flowers are all gone, all the trees become bare, the ground becomes frosty, it becomes ice. Um, there's going to be less resources about for these birds, these swallows. There's going to be um, competition, and there's going to be no food. So it's going to lead to death. So what they do is they fly down south where it's a warmer climate, so there'll be less um, competition for resources. 
because they'll be should be it's nice and hot there's lots of food around it's, it's not frozen and so on so that's a behavioral adaptation and then they'll fly back when it's summer here they'll, they'll fly back to the uk because uh, the weather and during springtime the weather's better so that is your lesson on selection so you've got uh, three types of selection we've got directional selection we've got stabilizing selection and we've got disruptive selection now i hope that's been useful for you and uh, you've learned something today um, next lesson we're going to go on to the next bit on biodiversity um, please watch the videos make sure you get all your work done on caboodle go through your textbook pages in caboodle and answer the summary questions and do the exam style questions at the end. I know Miss Martin is also doing the uh, sending you resources, worksheets and stuff on your show my homework. Any questions, please get back to me. Hope it's been useful and I'll see you next time on My Smart Learning. Take care. Bye.